Hello, this is Michael Paul with the New Orleans Scottish Rite College. I'd like to do a video today that takes a look at the very troubled creation in early years of the Scottish Rite. Now, I have to start off by saying that doing a subject like this is a bit problematic for a video, as the citations necessary for such an examination are difficult in video format. In addition, this subject is extremely complex and often difficult to follow, especially for someone just starting out. I've tried to keep things as basic and simple as possible, but the video does assume that the viewer has at least some basic knowledge of the early Scottish Rite history. The complexity of the subject is one of the reasons why I've delayed doing this video for so long. To hopefully get around this problem, this video is a bit of an expansion of the paper, The Grand Constitutions of 1786, at the beginning of my book, The Scottish Rite Papers. The paper is fully cited. If you have an interest in looking deeper into this subject, please follow the link in the description of this video for information on ordering the book. The book looks at this question as well as others concerning the early years of the Scottish Rite. Another problem is that when I do videos like this, some get the idea that I am attacking the Scottish Rite. Believe me, that's wholly untrue. My life is far richer because of the teachings of the Scottish Rite. As I've said in papers and videos before, my joining the Scottish Rite some 45 years ago now was like coming home for me. It is because of my deep love of the teachings of the Scottish Rite that I am compelled to point out and hopefully assist in correcting some of what I view as problem areas from the past. I'd like to contribute in some small way to making the Scottish Rite more of what I believe it should have always been. I view it as a responsibility. So. Let's start off with a most controversial subject. Few Masonic documents have been debated, praised, maligned, studied, and misunderstood more than the Grand Constitutions of 1786. There are actually two recognized collections with that name, one commonly known as the French version and the other, the Latin version. The Latin version is far more detailed and complete looking. The French version is bare bones and minimal. We'll talk about these different versions in a few minutes. There is also at least one other pretty much wholly discounted version that I'm not going to deal with in this video. But we need to ask, what are these grand constitutions? Why are they important? And why all the fuss about them throughout Scottish Rite history? Let me try to look at a very complicated and often contentious history and hopefully make things a little bit clearer and simpler. Let's start off with a nutshell overall explanation before we dig any deeper. The Grand Constitutions of 1786 are directly associated with the creation of the 33 degree Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite and are its original rules and regulations. These Grand Constitutions contain 18 articles or rules which were reported to be approved and signed in Berlin by King Frederick the Great on May 1st, 1786. The idea was to create a new Masonic system of 33 degrees. It was to be well organized and workable. There is no question that they were successful in that goal. While this new system built on and expanded on the degrees of the older Order of the Royal Secret, it's fair to say that this was a brand new and very beneficial system. Without getting into any lengthy discussion, the older Order of the Royal Secret was problematic in its manner of organization and government. The new system did bring order to the chaos of the old one. In addition, this new system reportedly had the blessing of European royalty. But the dilemma was, and always has been, that the entire story of the Grand Constitutions, as well as any approval by Frederick the Great or anyone, is unproven and very dubious by any objective study. No original grand constitutions have ever been discovered. In fact, nothing of an original has ever been proven to have been in the possession of anyone from any known Supreme Council. In other words, there is not a scrap of clear evidence that they ever actually existed. Today, we are hard pressed to find any serious historian who will claim that the grand constitutions are anything but a fabricated story. There may be some debate as to who fabricated the story, but most agree that it's simply a made-up tale. The first Supreme Council of this new 33-degree system, of which we can prove, was created in Charleston, South Carolina on May 31, 1801. It announced its existence 
in a document known as the Circular Throughout the Two Hemispheres and is published on pages 319 to 325 of Ray Baker Harris and James D. Carter's History of the Supreme Council, 33rd Degree, 1801 to 1861. Today, this Supreme Council is commonly known as the Southern Jurisdiction or the Mother Supreme Council, as it was the first one created. The Southern Jurisdiction is located today at the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C. But if you notice, I said that this is the first Supreme Council of which we can prove. I said that because while the early Southern Jurisdiction or Charleston Supreme Council can rightfully make the claim of being the first Supreme Council of the 33 degree system, a brand new system, that's not what's written in the copies that we have of the grand constitutions themselves. Remember, these constitutions were claimed to be the rule and law of the early Charleston Council. In those very constitutions, it states that they were made and approved in the Supreme Council of the 33rd, duly and lawfully established and congregated in the Grand East of Berlin on the 1st of May, Anna Lucci, 5786, and of the Christian era, 1786. The 1801 Charleston Supreme Council originally claimed the Grand Constitutions as their authority to exist and laws for their governance. The Grand Constitutions provided the first Supreme Council with a blueprint which guided them in the organization, structure, and management of this new system. In the early days of the new 33-degree Scottish Rite, the Grand Constitutions were perceived to be of great importance to the young Supreme Council, but they were really of little value to Grand Lodges. This new system was mostly viewed as side degrees by Grand Lodges, but for the Scottish Rite, they were originally central to the system's government and could be used as evidence of legitimacy. Interestingly enough, the Northern Masonic jurisdiction and the Southern jurisdiction have historically differed as to which version of the Grand Constitutions they acknowledge. The Northern jurisdiction accepted the French version and the Southern jurisdiction, the Latin version. I should also point out that they are not the same in style or content, but why should there be different versions of a document that would seem to be so crucial to the Scottish Rite? Where is the original? Well, the common claim was that the original was lost at sea when it was being transported to the United States. Copies were produced based on, I guess, what others remembered as being contained in those constitutions. Of course, in order to remember something, you would have had to have seen it. I've never seen a clear explanation as to how one would have known what was contained in these grand constitutions if they had never seen them. I've also never seen an account of anyone claiming to have actually held these constitutions in their hands or read it. If anyone saw it and copied it, then all others should be an exact copy of that copy. Logic dictates that either memories differed as to the contents, which would require several people seeing the original, or it was a work in progress. In other words, a forgery that evolved and changed over time. John Mitchell was the first Grand Commander of the Charleston Council or Southern Jurisdiction. Mitchell had been a Deputy Inspector General for the older 25-degree Masonic system known as the Order of the Royal Secret, but often commonly called the Rite of Perfection. A Deputy Inspector General was one who had received the 25th degree of this older system. This was the highest degree in this system and gave them defined rights and privileges. In 1807, another Deputy Inspector General of the Order of the Royal Secret, Joseph Cerno, created bodies in New York that would evolve into a second Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite in the U.S. The Charleston Council did not approve of, or apparently even initially know about, the creation of this second U.S. Supreme Council in New York. When they learned of this new council, the Charleston Council would use the Grand Constitutions in their argument that this Second Supreme Council was illegal and irregular. In 1813, Emmanuel de la Mata, an active member of the Charleston Council, traveled to New York and, with or without the knowledge or authorization of the Charleston Council, created a Supreme Council in New York on August 5, 1813. The intention seems to have been to replace the Cerno Council with this new one. 
1813 council would become the northern Masonic jurisdiction. I should note, some confusion seems to have existed for a period of time as to the exact year that the northern jurisdiction was created. In a few places, Albert Pike noted that the creation was in 1813 or 1815. Regardless of any confusion, the documents that exist show that it was in 1813. When the Charleston Supreme Council demanded that Cerdo produce documentation showing that it was authorized to exist, Cerdo Council produced nothing. The Charleston Council labeled the Cerdo Council as irregular and Cerdo a fraud. When the Cerdo Council demanded that the Charleston Council give proof that they were authorized to exist, the Charleston Council pointed to its copy of the Grand Constitutions. The Cerdo Council dismissed this copy as a forgery and accused the rival group of hypocrisy. The Cerdo Council claimed it had the same right and authority to exist, as did the Charleston Council. They demanded that the standards of legitimacy should be the same for everyone. But why would Cerno have the same rights and how? But then again, why would he not have the same rights? Another claim made by the Charleston Council was that any additional Supreme Council created in the United States needed its approval, which it did not give to Cerno. This requirement or right, however, appears nowhere in the Grand Constitutions when speaking of the United States. But we might note that communications between De La Mata and the Charleston Council did seem to suggest that the Charleston Council was the Supreme Council for the United States. But it also exposes a conflict of interpretation in how many Supreme Councils were allowed by these constitutions and where. We'll talk more about this shortly. So, who, if anyone, was correct? Is it possible that the Grand Constitution of 1786 were a forgery and never approved by Frederick? Let's have a look at what some have said about the two versions of the Grand Constitutions. Of the French version, the version historically accepted by the Northern jurisdiction, Albert Pike says, if I was satisfied that there never were any other constitutions than those contained in the French version, I should not hesitate to admit that they were a clumsy forgery and that there was nothing in the world to prove them authentic. Okay, those are some very strong words, but why would Pike write such a powerful denunciation of this French version? Past Southern Jurisdiction Sovereign Grand Commander Henry Clausen explains. Pike's Latin version is obviously a truer copy of the original because it supplies omissions and corrections that were apparent in the French version. Okay, but of course, the first question that comes to mind is, without the original, how would illustrious brother Clausen know which version was the truer copy or anything at all about omissions or corrections? He couldn't. All that he or anyone else could do is express an opinion. Regardless, Albert Pike would go on to provide a lengthy, rational, and categorical reproof for the French version, making it difficult to understand how one could, with any understanding of Pike's argument and its implications, reasonably defend the French version as legitimate. Yet this is the very version that the Northern jurisdiction accepted. Why? Even more interesting is the fact that Pike himself used this French version to support his position in a Masonic debate. In the 1860s, the Supreme Councils of the Northern Jurisdiction and Southern Jurisdiction entered into a debate over territory. The Northern Jurisdiction wanted certain states, and the Southern Jurisdiction said, no, you can't have them. Joshua Drummond, the Grand Commander of the Northern Jurisdiction, and Albert Pike, the Grand Commander of the Southern Jurisdiction, debated jurisdictional questions over these states, and who would control which states. Drummond wrote to Pike in 1868, I hold that under the constitutions of 1786, the northern jurisdiction and the southern jurisdiction are, in every respect and for all purposes, as distinct as if they were separate nations, that we, as well as you, derive our rights of jurisdiction from those constitutions, that those constitutions create two separate jurisdictions. On the other hand, 
I perceive that you have held that your Supreme Council had jurisdiction throughout North America, and that we get our territory by session from you, and if by session, consequently we get only such territory as you choose to cede, and as necessary. There could have been no Supreme Council in this jurisdiction unless you had chosen to cede us territory. How did Pike answer Drummond? Well, he answered by arguing the meaning of certain phrases of the French version. He wrote, I do not agree that the constitutions created the two jurisdictions, for the United States composed a single jurisdiction until 1813 or 1815, and might have continued to be as such until today. The provision is restrictive, that there shall not be more than two Supreme Councils established in the United States. That's the real meaning of it, not that there shall be two, but the point is of no practical importance, and I pass it. If illustrious brother Drummond were right in holding that the northern part of the United States did not belong to the jurisdiction of the Southern Council prior to 1813 or 1815, but was to vest, whether it willed it or not, in a northern council, whenever one should be created there, a consequence which he does not foresee might follow. That hypothesis would make the northern states to have been unoccupied territory in which any inspector general could establish a supreme council, and it might thus make legitimate the Sereno Council and annihilate that created in 1813 or 1815 by de la Mata. It certainly would destroy the principal ground upon which the legitimacy of Cyrano's council was always impeached, to wit, that the council at Charleston had jurisdiction over the whole United States, and that no other council could be created anywhere in them except with its consent. Interesting. Pike and Drummond debated in part the meaning of Article 5 of the French version of the Grand Constitutions, which determined the number of Supreme Councils allowed in various parts of the world. This debate resulted in Pike producing quite lengthy arguments concerning French and English grammar and the reasons for his position concerning the meaning of Article 5 of the French version. Pike even changed a portion of the English translation in his 1872 Grand Constitutions to reflect his opinion of this rendition. In his 1868 allocation, Pike very skillfully debated this interpretation of Article 5 of the French version at length. But why should Pike bother to painstakingly argue a point specifically concerning a version of a document that he had soundly dismissed as a clumsy forgery? For the sake of clearly explaining his position, Pike should have debated the Latin version, which he claimed to be legitimate. Why didn't he? Aren't they the same? No, they are not the same. They are differences in them, and some of them are significant. Simply put, Albert Pike could not debate this portion of the Latin version, the very version that Pike claimed to be legitimate. And the reason is very interesting. The same portion of Article 5 of the Latin version, the version Pike refers to as the law of the right, reads, In each great nation of Europe, and in each kingdom or empire there shall be but one single supreme council of this degree, in all those states and providences, as well as of the mainland as of the islands whereof North America is composed, there shall be two councils, one as great a distance as may be from the other. Pike strongly contended that the meaning of Article 5 of the French version was that the U.S. was not required to be divided into two jurisdictions. Yet that is precisely what the Latin version said, which Pike had himself published in 1859. Pike used the French version in his debate with Drummond because it was more open to individual interpretation. The undesired consequence that Pike claimed if Drummond's interpretation is accepted was clearly present in the Latin version, which Pike avoided using. Sir, no, it seems, might have had a very good reason based on either version of the Grand Constitutions, to believe that he had every right to establish his creation. The problem for Drummond was that Pike had skillfully painted him into a tight corner with his clever use of Drummond's French version. Drummond was not going to do something that might damage the northern jurisdiction. The territorial debate ended with Drummond yielding to Pike's demands. 
The view held by Drummond, however, was not only based on his interpretation of Article 5 of the French version, but also on the birth certificate of the Northern Council itself, which reads in part, And whereas the grand constitutions of the 33rd specify particularly that there shall be two grand and supreme councils of the 33rd degree for the jurisdiction of the United States of America, one for the South and the other for the North. It's obvious why Drummond interpreted Article 5 of the French version as he did. The Northern jurisdiction was created on the position that there shall be two Supreme Councils in the United States. Drummond's view was that the Northern and Southern portions of the United States should be treated as if they were two separate nations. This was also clearly how de la Mata viewed the situation. That position is supported by the Grand Constitutions and the birth certificate of the Northern Council. The only contention could have been if Cerno was not a legitimate sovereign Grand Inspector General. If he was legitimate, then the Cerno Council would seem to be perfectly legal, and the Northern jurisdiction was, by its own stated reason for being created, unauthorized. But Emmanuel de la Mata, upon meeting Cerno, did not believe him to be a legitimate 33rd. De La Mata asked to see Cerno's 33rd degree patent, and Cerno did not provide it. He didn't seem to have one, and nothing has been offered to prove that he did. So, for De La Mata, that was it. Cerno didn't show his patent because he didn't have one. He didn't have one because he was lying about the being a 33rd. End of story. Well, maybe not. Let's look closer at this situation. Pike's opinions concerning the meaning of the French version of the Grand Constitutions and their implications were clearly not shared by Emmanuel de la Mata, who created the Northern Jurisdiction and was an active member of the original Charleston Council. It is likewise evident why Pike's unspoken threats might have been taken seriously. Drummond did yield to Pike. The only available attack that could be reasonably made on Cerno from the Northern Jurisdiction perspective was to discredit his legitimacy as a 33rd. To discredit Cerno by saying that there was only one Supreme Council allowed in the U.S. put the Northern jurisdiction in a bad position, and it was not something that was in their known copy of the Grand Constitutions. But, as amazing as it may sound today, we can see that both Joseph Cerno and John Mitchell, Charleston's first Grand Commander, were, in one aspect, in the very same boat. No 33rd degree patent for either one of them has ever been discovered. To discredit Cerno's 33rd by only pointing out that he did not have a patent could clearly discredit Mitchell as well. But that brings us to the $10,000 question. How did both Mitchell and Cerno receive the 33rd degree? Who gave it to them? Where are their patents? The short answer is that I have never seen a word written in any of the classical Scottish Rite history books that provided definitive proof on how either one of them received the 33rd degree. We normally see what turns out to be convoluted and mostly painfully complex opinions, often disguised as facts. But there are some clues. One thing that we must never do is judge past events by today's standards. What is normal and common practice today may have been very different in the past. We also cannot forget that we are talking about the creation of a brand new system. We're not talking about a system that has existed for over 220 years. So, let's look at it. First off, the first 33rd degree patent ever given to anyone that we know about was the one given by John Mitchell to Frederick Delco on May 25th, 1801. That's just six days before the creation of the first Supreme Council in Charleston. No earlier 33rd degree patent is known to exist. The question of how John Mitchell received the 33rd degree did not escape early Scottish Rite historians. It's often said that Mitchell received the 33rd from some older 25th degree Mason. Several names have been suggested in various books. But, if Mitchell received the 33rd degree from an old 25th degree Mason, who gave the 25th degree Mason the 33rd degree? 
Isn't it true that you must be a 33rd to give the 33rd? We also see in the Harrison Carter history that in 1829, Moses Holbrook, the then Grand Commander of the Southern Jurisdiction, wrote to J.J.J. J. J. Gorgas of the Northern Jurisdiction about how Mitchell might have received the 33rd degree. Holbrook wrote, I took the opportunity in mentioning it to Brother Delco to ask how Mitchell got the 33rd. He replied that he could not recollect, but he, Mitchell, had signed some obligation in French for it. He thinks it came from some Prussian who was in Charleston who was authorized to communicate it to him. Why would a Prussian give an obligation to an Irishman in the United States, written in French? In later years, Albert Pike said that he didn't believe that Mitchell could even read French. Well, regardless, I've never seen any proof that either Sir No or Mitchell ever received the 33rd degree from anyone. But John Mitchell was the first Grand Commander of the first Supreme Council. He had to be a 33rd, right? Well, before we say that either one of them did or did not have something, let's see if there's another explanation. When we look through old Masonic books to try and discover hidden gems, we find that sometimes more than one book is necessary for an answer, even if it's only a possible answer. However, before I take another step, let me clearly explain something. Not for a moment do I believe or suggest that any aspect of Freemasonry was created by the Almighty kissing his fingers and boom, creating some part of Masonry. Human beings created Freemasonry. They created it with all their flaws, genius, and insecurities. The 33rd degree, as well as the whole of the new 33 degree system, was created by one or more individuals thinking it up, writing it down, and then going through all the steps to take it from an idea to a working new system. The inspiration may have been divine, but the action was human. So let's look at the period of time around 1801. Both John Mitchell and Joseph Cyrano came to hold the 25th degree of the Old Order of the Royal Secret, or often called the Rite of Perfection. This system was in a troubled situation. It just wasn't working. The Masons who gathered in Charleston knew that the grand old system was in trouble, and they were trying to find a way to save or reorganize this beautiful system. And they did. By any objective examination, the 33 degree system is more workable and organized than the old 25 degree system. But these guys didn't have the internet or telephones to spread the word. It was a slower process, but word did start to get out and when given the choice between the two systems, a significant number belonging to the older system did decide to move to the newer one. It was clearly a better system. So, how did they do it? They had to have thought about a process to move from one system to the other. It makes no sense to create a new Masonic rite which builds on and improves on an older one, but not have a means to bring in those interested from the older system. Without a good deal of trouble, we can find accounts of the process of moving from the old 25 degree system to the new 33 degree one. As an example, look on page 125 of the 1995 edition of Carl's Masonic Encyclopedia. Under the heading of Joseph Cerno, it states, Meanwhile in Charleston, South Carolina in 1801, the 32 degree system had been perfected, and in the process, the old 25th degree Prince Mason, or Prince of the Royal Secret, had shifted to the 32nd place. Since Cerno held the Prince Mason degree, he conceived that he should shift with it, and as it went to the head of the list, so did he. Perhaps he was entitled to do that. Perhaps others did so, especially those who belonged to the right at Charleston. But he was not entitled under any authority or by any interpretation of power to establish bodies of any right in New York. Okay, so exactly what are we talking about here? Cerno held the 25th degree of the older system. The 33rd degree is not mentioned in this quote, but the 32nd is. If we look closely at this statement, what is being said here is that the 25th degree of the old system became the 32nd degree of the new system. Cerno learned of this new system 
and as he was a 25th degree Mason, moved over to the new system, and with that, he held the 32nd degree. It also says perhaps he was entitled to do that. Perhaps others did so, especially those who belonged to the right at Charleston. He's clearly talking about Mitchell and the other 25th degree Masons in the Charleston area. But then is added, but he, Zerno, was not entitled under any authority or by any interpretation of power to establish bodies of any right in New York. Well, yeah. I've never known or heard of any 32nd who was entitled to create a Supreme Council. At least, I don't think so. But Albert Pike did say something very interesting. In his grand constitutions, he offers us. Article 1. Wherever in a state where there is neither a grand consistory nor a grand council of sublime princes of the royal secret, there are any grand inspectors general and princes of the royal secret, the Grand Inspector General, whose patent and recognition bear the oldest date, or, if there be no Inspector General, then the oldest Prince of the Royal Secret, is invested with the administrative and dogmatic power of high masonry, and takes accordingly the title of Sovereign. Albert Pike is clearly speaking about the process that was seemingly used for John Mitchell to move from the old system to the new one, and how he became a 33rd. Mitchell was the senior 25th degree Mason in the Charleston area. With the creation of the new 33 degree system, Mitchell moved from the 25th degree Prince Mason to the 32nd degree Prince of the Royal Secret. As the senior 32nd in the area, this provision allowed him to take the title of Sovereign or become a 33rd and then Sovereign Grand Commander by means of his position in the old system and status in the new one. Mitchell does not seem to have been given the 33rd degree as it is done today, but it seems possible that he became a 33rd by means of the general principles of the order and the need to create new organizations of that order. A process was defined and used to elevate one to the highest degree of this new system when the situation required it. Mitchell did not receive the 33rd in the same manner that we do today, but he was elevated to that degree by means of an administrative process, following the rules that were created before he received a degree. Once in possession of the 33rd, he gave it to Delco, and then set upon the work of giving it to others and creating a Supreme Council. Was there a third 33rd when Delco was given this degree? Maybe not, but we'll talk more about this in a few minutes. Anyway, this is why I believe Mitchell did not have a 33rd degree patent. But what about Cerno? Joseph Cerno traveled from Cuba to New York, where he created bodies that evolved into a second Supreme Council of this new 33-degree system in the United States. I've seen no records to show how he learned of this new 33-degree system, but there are only so many options. I've also seen nothing at all to suggest that Cerno played any role in the planning process or the creation of the Charleston Supreme Council. Either Cyrano saw the original Grand Constitutions of 1786, which I don't believe, or he saw a copy of it, or he met someone who knew of the Charleston Supreme Council and this new system. I believe it only makes sense that Cyrano traveled into the Charleston area for who knows what reason, and he met Masons, maybe members of the Charleston Supreme Council, who told him about the events. He did learn of it somewhere, sadly. There are no records of any such meetings. Such a meeting or meetings only dictated by logic. He did learn of this new system, and it had to be from somewhere. For all I know, his going to New York may have been the result of learning of this new system. I also have no idea if Cerno went to New York with the goal of establishing a Supreme Council of this new system, or if this system was, at that time, just something interesting that he filed away in his mind. His going to New York may have had nothing at all to do with Freemasonry. He may have only planned on going to New York to open a jewelry shop there, which he did. We don't have any account from him to explain his actions. But on October 28, 1807, Joseph Serrano created bodies in New York that would evolve into a second Supreme Council in the U.S. That was a shot that started a true Masonic war and U.S. Masonry throughout the 1800s was horribly affected from it. 
We can even today point to some current situations that are the direct result of those wars. And there's really no other word for it. On one side, Cyrano became a devil and an example of everything wrong with Freemasonry. His very name is today used in Masonic encyclopedias as a word to define irregular masonry. On the other side of the coin, the southern jurisdiction was painted by the Cyrano Masons as an example of how an intolerant, unjust, and power-hungry group is perfectly willing to destroy Masons and Masonic bodies that encroach on what is believed to be their property. And these were all Masons. Who was right and who was wrong often depended on who you asked. The basic question boils down to, did Joseph Cerno have the right to establish the bodies that he established? Let's see if there is a reasonable answer to that question. There is so much about the creation of the first Supreme Council that we simply cannot answer today with clear evidence. So much just does not exist. But one of the questions that we cannot answer actually does give us some hope. That question is, will we ever discover new things that were unknown yesterday? Yes, that is very possible. New discoveries are always happening and have happened in the past. For example, it would seem that Albert Pike was unaware of the existence of a handwritten copy of the Grand Constitutions that had been made by Frederick Delco. Delco was the first Lieutenant Grand Commander of the Charleston Council and its second Grand Commander. The Delco copy of the Grand Constitution is said not to have been discovered until the 20th century. This copy is fully reproduced in the Harris Carter History of the Supreme Council on pages 335 to 346. Pike boldly proclaimed that the French version was a fraud and offered very lucid support for his position. Pike seems to have had no idea that what he so soundly proclaimed to be a fraud came directly from the hand of the Charleston's second grand commander. In fact, the Delco handwritten copy makes one point even clearer than Pike's Latin version. Concerning the number of Supreme Councils allowed, Article 5 reads, There shall be but one council of this degree in each nation or kingdom in Europe. Two in the United States of America, as remote from each other as possible. Well, that's pretty clear. But what I certainly don't want to do is to try and to get into the head of Albert Pike to try and guess at his reason for doing or saying things. Pike did know the wording of the Latin version prior to his debate with Drummond, but he chose not to mention it. It's not impossible that Pike wrote what he did to try and bluff Drummond. Maybe he just wanted him to back down, and that's exactly what Drummond did. He did back down and yielded to Pike's wishes. But what about the claim that Pike made about Cerno? The grand constitutions, at least the copies we have, do seem to all say that the U.S. shall have two councils. So, different rules would apply in the U.S. than in other countries. Charleston was the first one, and Cerno would seem to be the second one. Does that automatically make Cerno valid? Well, in theory, maybe, but the situations were not the same. We'll get back to this question in a few minutes. But let's first again look at the arguments concerning Cerno with the backdrop of the Grand Constitutions themselves. Customarily, papers discussing Joseph Cerno include arguments concerning the Grand Constitutions and vice versa. Cerno is usually accused of acting in violation of these constitutions. 19th century defenders of Cerno typically argue the lack of legitimacy of the grand constitutions with the apparent belief that if they could be discredited, then all charges against Cerno would likewise be dismissed. One claim that was often made was that Frederick the Great had been in very poor health at the time that the constitutions were said to be approved and that he was physically unable to have given his consent. Albert Pike went to great lengths to examine the charge that Frederick was not physically able to have executed such a document. Pike meticulously traced the reported events and laid out a detailed report on his position that it was possible for Frederick to have executed the Grand Constitutions. Pike's conclusions were perfectly logical. 
No other jurisdiction Scottish Rite historian, Samuel Bainet, however, takes a dim view of all versions of the Grand Constitutions. He writes of Pike's conclusions. Though we admit that our illustrious brother did in a masterly manner fully convince us that Frederick, on May 1st, 1786, was physically able and mentally capable of drafting, signing, and promulgating these grand constitutions, we have utterly failed to find that he discovered or pointed out to us one scintilla of evidence that Frederick actually did have ought to do with them. Pike was obviously aware that his lengthy account did not answer the actual question of whether Frederick did sign or approve the grand constitutions. Pike addressed this point in a most interesting manner. He writes, There is not one particle of proof of any sort, circumstantial or historical, or by argument from improbability, that they are not genuine and authentic. As remarkable as it sounds, Pike is asking us to prove a negative. That's not how research works. Was Albert Pike the Mason trying to answer a historical question? Or was Albert Pike the attorney writing a legal brief and maneuvering or leaving out what he felt did not help his case? It's almost like Pike is saying, look here when we should have been looking over there. But we need to stop for a moment and ask again, which version was Pike defending? Was it the French version that he so soundly proclaimed to be a fraud? Or was it the Latin version? I'm not 100% sure. Regardless, Baynard continues, We conclude, therefore, 1. That the Grand Constitutions were not promulgated by Frederick the Great. 2. That they were not framed, drawn up, or signed in Berlin. 3. That there did not exist in Berlin, or even France in 1786, any Grand Supreme Universal Inspectors in Constitute Supreme Council. 4. That the real date of the Constitutions is subsequent to 1786. But if the Grand Constitutions are a forgery, then who forged them? That question did not escape Baynard. It's only natural that the next question would be, well, then who did frame them? We do not know. Neither are we unduly disturbed because we do not know. We have our opinion, but it is not substantiated by any evidence that we can call positive or direct, and therefore we do not express it as a conclusion. Okay, to summarize the situation, Pike pronounced the French version of the Grand Constitutions to be a forgery. He seemed to be debating the merits of why the Latin version should be considered legitimate. Bain had rejected both versions of the Grand Constitutions, but he does not choose to say who he believes forged them. Regarding the possibility that the Latin version might also be a forgery, Pike tells us, The odious charge has been again and again repeated that these Latin Constitutions were forged at Charleston. It is quite certain that this is not true, because the Supreme Council at Charleston never had them until it received copies of the editions published by the Grand Commander. If they were forged anywhere, it was not at Charleston, and if anything was forged there, it was the French copy, as it afterwards appeared in a reculed axe. Pike seems to be saying that whoever created the French version committed forgery, and elsewhere. The gentlemen of South Carolina in that day did not commit forgery. Whatever the origin of the Grand Constitutions, they came from Europe to Charleston and were accepted and received by the honorable gentlemen and clergymen who were of the first Supreme Council in perfect good faith. If the Grand Constitutions are forged documents, but the original Charleston Council did not forge them, then how did they come into possession of them? Pike theorizes. This very imperfect French copy, which consists merely of so many articles without preface, formality of enactment by any body in power, or authentication of any sort, contains no list of the degrees, nor even the name of the right. It is most probable that de Grasse procured it in or from Europe and created the Supreme Council. By Article 5 of these constitutions, it requires three persons to constitute a quorum and compose a Supreme Council, and therefore Colonel Mitchell and Dr. Delco alone 
could not have been by themselves such a body. Brother de Grasse intended establishing a Supreme Council at Santo Domingo for the French West India Islands, and no other person had any interest to make the constitutions read so as to allow such a council, except his father-in-law, Jean-Baptiste Delahogue, who also resided in Charleston in 1796, 1799, and 1801, and was also a 33rd and appointed to be Lieutenant Grand Commander of the French West Indies. It was for this reason, evidently, that neither of them was placed on the roll of members of the body at Charleston. Okay, so let's take everything else and put it aside for a moment. Let's look at what is now being offered by Baynard and Pike. Baynard held the opinion that the entire story of the Grand Constitutions was a fabrication. He based his opinion on the total lack of factual evidence supporting the account and the improbability of the reported events. Pike soundly denounced the French version as a fraud, but held to the possibility of the legitimacy of the Latin version. Pike pointed out that the original Charleston Council did not have possession or knowledge of the Latin version and had based their actions on the fraudulent French version. Pike also stated that he believes that it was Alexander de Grasse who brought the forged French version to Charleston and implied that it was de Grasse who might actually have forged them. Pike stated that de Grasse was probably the 33rd who, along with Mitchell and Delco, opened the first Supreme Council session on May 31st, 1801. But the birth certificate of Charleston Council, the um, circular throughout the two hemispheres, says that de Grasse was a Deputy Inspector General of the 25th degree until February of 1802, when he was appointed a 33rd by Mitchell and the Supreme Council. Frederick Delco also stated in his letter to De La Mata on August 23rd, 1813, that de Grasse had not received the 33rd degree until February of 1802. So how could de Grasse have helped open the first Supreme Council in May of 1801 if he was not then a 33rd? We'll come back to this need of three 33rds in a moment. There are several logical scenarios that we can explore. The first would be that Mitchell and Delco received the grand constitutions, sincerely believing that they were legitimate. Another would be that Mitchell and Delco took part in the creation of the grand constitutions or knew that they were a forgery. If Mitchell and Delco believed that the grand constitutions were legitimate, we can look at the series of events with that mindset. Suppose Mitchell and Delco believed that they were introducing to the U.S. a European system created some 15 years before the creation of the Charleston Council. In that case, they could have reasonably assumed that other Supreme Councils of the 33rd degree existed in Europe. Clearly, the Grand Constitution speak of such a council in Berlin. On August 23rd, 1813, John Mitchell wrote to Emmanuel de la Mata concerning de la Mata's report on Joseph Cyrano. Mitchell wrote in part, I am truly surprised and astonished at the conduct of the man you say is called Mr. Joseph Cerno. No person ever had the degree but the Count de Grasse, and perhaps, but I'm not sure, Mr. Delahogue. We must stop for a moment to try and understand this comment by Mitchell. If Mitchell received a copy of the Grand Constitutions and accepted them as legitimate, how could he be so sure that no one else had the degree? What about the Supreme Council in Berlin cited in the Grand Constitutions? The copy of the Grand Constitutions of 1786 that Mitchell had available to him opens as follows. Made and approved in the Supreme Council of the 33rd, duly and lawfully established and congregated in the Grand East of Berlin on the 1st of May, Anno Luci 5786, and of the Christian era, 1786 at which council was present in person his most august majesty, Frederick II, King of Prussia, Sovereign Grand Commander. Was the Supreme Council of the 33rd in Berlin composed of members who did not have the 33rd degree? Why would they not? It makes no sense. Mitchell writes that de Grasse was the only person he was certain had the degree. When is he talking about? What about the other 33rds in the Charleston Supreme Council after 1801. Mitchell wrote this letter 
in 1813. Also by that time, Supreme Councils of the new 33-degree system had been created in at least the West Indies, Jamaica, France, Italy, and Spain. The comments by Mitchell were extraordinary. Frederick Delco, the Lieutenant Grand Commander of the Charleston Council, also sent a letter to De La Mata on the same day as Mitchell's letter, and also concerning the new Cyrano creation. It again should be noted that the date of Delco's letter was August 23, 1813. Emmanuel de la Mata established the Supreme Council for the Northern Jurisdiction 18 days earlier on August 5, 1813. Delco wrote, It is well known to those who have lawfully received the 33rd degree that there can be one council in a nation or kingdom, and that the Council for the U.S. was lawfully established in this city May 31, 1801. Consequently, any other assuming its prerogatives must be surreptitious. What does Delco mean by this statement? Well, Article 9 of the Grand Constitution reads, No deputy inspector can use his patent in any country where a Supreme Council of Inspectors General is established, unless it shall be signed by said council. Looks like Delco is using a selective combination of Articles 5 and 9 in his letter to De La Mata. Let's take a moment and look at the two articles when read together. Let's say that we are in a country in Europe. The relevant part of Article 5 says, there shall be but one council of this degree in each nation or kingdom of Europe. All right, that's pretty clear. One council for each nation or kingdom in Europe. Okay, but now reread Article 9 with how it may apply to all of Europe. Article 9 is saying that if you go into a country that already has a Supreme Council, you need to get the original council to approve the creation of another. Okay, got it. So, if Masons of the proper rank establish a Supreme Council in a country where no other council exists, that's the one original Supreme Council. But Article 9 does seem to conditionally remove the one council limit in Article 5 by obtaining permission. Okay, so let's say that Masons of proper rank wish to create 10 different Supreme Councils in that European country that has a Supreme Council, and the original council gives approval for all of them. Then all should be fine, right? No other cap can be found as to the number of Supreme Councils if approval is given. But Article 5 also says there shall be two for the United States. That's different than the one council limit for Europe. What does it mean? In Albert Pike's debate with Joshua Drummond, Pike argued that the meaning of Article 5 was restrictive, that there shall not be more than two councils in the U.S. Once the second is created, that's it. No more can be created. But how does that restrictive aspect of Article 5 apply to Europe? In Europe, would it mean that there shall not be more than one council? How does this restrictive interpretation apply to Article 9? If one is all that is allowed, why would you have an article saying that you need to get permission to create another? One is all that's allowed. But maybe the restrictive aspect means that one is all that is allowed before you need to get the original council permission to create others. Okay, but that brings us back to the original understanding. And then, how does it apply to the situation in the U.S.? If one is all that is allowed in Europe before permission is necessary, then two would be all that's allowed in the U.S. before permission is needed. Pike and Delco's argument was that Cerno was not legitimate because he needed permission from Charleston to exist. Why? The grand constitutions provide for one council in Europe and two in the U.S. It's only when you want an additional number that you would need anyone's permission, right? Albert Pike's argument, as well as Delco, only stands up 
when a selected version of the constitutions are being used, along with a single selected article, ignoring all other articles. No matter how you cut it, Grand Commander Drummond was right. The Grand Constitutions did view the northern and southern areas of the U.S. as if they were two separate nations, one council for each of the two defined areas in the U.S., and then permission is necessary for any more in each area. And Drummond was not alone in this position. So, what of De La Mata's creation? Delco's one council comment in his letter might well have meant Charleston and no one else, including De La Mata's creation. Delco might not have initially approved of the De La Mata Council any more than the Cerno one. The northern jurisdiction does seem to have been created without prior approval. But why? Didn't De La Mata know of Delco's one council rule? If not, why not? Delco said that the one council rule was well known to those who have lawfully received the 33rd degree. Why would De La Mata, like Cerno, act in New York without prior approval from Charleston? Is Delco suggesting that De La Mata did not lawfully receive the 33rd degree? I doubt that, but clearly De La Mata had a different opinion of the meaning of the Grand Constitutions. The birth certificate of the Northern Masonic jurisdiction created by De La Mata tells us there shall be two Grand and Supreme Councils for the 33rd degree for the jurisdiction of the United States of America, one for the South and the other for the North. This would seem to be De La Mata's understanding of the Grand Constitution. There seems to be great confusion in the temple. I am wholly in an agreement with Samuel Baynard in his rejection of the legitimacy of all versions of the Grand Constitutions. In the absence of any other reasonable explanation, I believe that John Mitchell and Frederick Delco took part in the fabrication of the story of the Grand Constitutions, either in whole or in part. I hold the opinion that Mitchell, Delco, and others held reasonable concern regarding the failing and chaotic state of the order of the royal secret. To bring order to the chaos, the new 33 degree system was created. The cream of the crop of the degrees and rituals was selected for this new system. It was an inspired creation for which we can imagine a reasonable concern developed over whether it would be accepted by the whole of Freemasonry. A royal endorsement would add value to any new Masonic system, and one attached to a set of governing laws might bestow even greater value. I believe that the story and the situation began to unravel with the discovery of the Cerno bodies. Is it possible that de Grasse was the author of the original 33rd degree, as Albert Pike suggested? Sure, I believe that is very possible. Is it possible that de Grasse came up with the idea of the new 33 degree system, replacing the failing 25 degree order of the raw secret? Sure, I also believe that's possible. Is it possible that de Grasse came up with the story of the Grand Constitutions of 1786? Maybe. Is it possible that the original Charleston members were innocent victims of a very clever ruse by de Grasse or someone, and that they played no part whatsoever in the creation of the 33 degree system or the story of the Grand Constitutions? No, such a conclusion is not at all supported by the known evidence. As for Cerno, well, for a moment, let's take all the many years of published comments about him on both sides and put them aside. Let's just take a look at a few things. Both John Mitchell and Joseph Cerno held the 25th degree from the Order of the Royal Secret. John Mitchell was the founding Grand Commander of the Charleston Supreme Council because he was the senior 25th degree Mason in the unoccupied Charleston area. He announced his authority to create certain bodies by the rights given in the Grand Constitutions of 1786. And yes, I know, just moments ago I said that I believe them to be a forgery. I do. But for this discussion, it really doesn't matter if those constitutions were real or a forgery or who forged them. Let me explain. Right now, it only matters that they were accepted by the Charleston members as their rules. 
They bound themselves to these rules, whoever wrote them. That's what we need to remember. Either they followed their own rules or they didn't. Joseph Cerno did learn of this new creation somewhere. If Cerno did not take part in the creation of the new system and only learned of it during his travels, then how would he have known for sure if the grand constitutions were real or a forgery? Is it possible that Cerno was told about this new system and initially had no reason at all to doubt what he was being told? Sure, that's reasonable. Cerno might well have believed the story of the new system coming from Europe and the Charleston Council being created by the right of Mitchell's 25th degree. Even if he didn't know much at all about this system, it seems logical for Cerno to believe that this happened and that he also had the same right because of his degree under the same situations. Once in New York, he did decide to create bodies of this new system, and he viewed it as his right, according to his rank in the old order of the royal secret, just like John Mitchell. It's perfectly logical to think that he could have thought this, but were the situations the same? Not really. Let's see if we could look at the whole situation. When we look at the early years of the Cerno bodies in New York, we can see rather clearly that Cerno must not have learned much more than just the very basics of this new system. So much of what Cerno did in the early days was dramatically different from the Charleston creation. While the structure and authority of the Charleston Council did change following its birth announcement in 1802, the early Cerno bodies can hardly be recognized as a Supreme Council of this new 33 degree system. It resembled more of what he must have known of the old order of the royal secret. But really, that does make some sense. There are no available records to show how Cerno learned of this new system. Based on Mitchell, Delco, and De Lamata's reaction to him, it's doubtful that they knew him. It's not unreasonable to think that all he learned of the new system was in casual conversation with someone who knew about the system. Maybe it was over dinner or drinks in a tavern. We have no idea, as there is nothing left by him. No memoirs, diary, nothing from him to explain his actions. So, I believe it is likely that Cerno did initially believe the story about the Grand Constitutions. He also must have learned only the very basics of it. Of course, how would the Masons in New York know if Cerno was knowledgeable or not about this new system? Also, if De La Mata only visited Cerno in his shop, how would he know the quality of the work in the Cerno bodies? So, why would De La Mata, Mitchell, and Delco so quickly take such a negative position about Cerno? Why didn't they give him any benefit of the doubt? By the time De La Mata arrived, Cerno and his bodies had been around for a number of years. How did they know that he didn't create these bodies with the same authority, and they just didn't know about it. Well, could it have been that the Charleston Council felt rightfully injured that this Cerno guy stole what they knew they created, and he didn't even ask? Could the insult and shock of their creation being taken without their permission have caused them to lose it and go on the attack so quickly? I believe that is very possible. And what were the attacks on Cerno? I found two early main areas of early attack on him. One was that because he did not provide a 33rd degree patent, then he could not be a legitimate 33rd, period. The second was that he was not authorized to create a second Supreme Council because one already existed in the United States and he did not receive their permission to create another one. And yes, there was another area of attack of sorts that came later on. It had to do with Cerno's patent as a Deputy Inspector General of the 25th degree. It limited him to certain area of Cuba. I see this as more of a distraction or a Hail Mary rather than an attack with any real teeth. Cerno, even with his very limited knowledge, was clearly trying to establish bodies of the new 33 degree system. If his patent for the old system limited him to only one city block, 
all the whole world, it was still irrelevant. In this situation, his 25th degree patent's only use was as a vehicle to move him from one system to the other one. It's like saying that a medical doctor in Ohio can't switch professions and become an attorney in California because his medical license limits him to Ohio. It's not valid, but regardless of everything else, he did make a lot of mistakes. However, there is one area of criticism of Cerno that doesn't seem to be mentioned much at all, and it does have some teeth. Let's set the stage and look at it. I've found no convincing records and don't really have an opinion as to why Cerno traveled to New York. He seems to have arrived there sometime around late 1806 or early 1807. The records show that masonry in New York at the time of Cerno's arrival was in a complicated state. It was divided into two political rival groups. One group was led by a mason by the name of Daniel D. Tompkins. The other group was led by DeWitt Clinton. Tompkins and Clinton did not at all like each other. Tompkins served as governor of the state of New York from 1807 to 1817. In 1817, Tompkins was elected vice president of the United States. He was an active mason who would be elected Grand Master of the Grand Lodge in New York in 1820. Clinton had served as a United States Senator out of New York until 1803, when he was elected as mayor of New York City. He served as mayor from 1803 until 1815. Upon Daniel Tompkins' resignation as governor of New York to accept the vice presidency in 1817, Clinton won a special election to the governor's office. Tompkins was apparently not happy that Clinton had won his old governor's seat and while serving as vice president, ran against Clinton for the governor's office in 1820. In a close election, Clinton won re-election. Clinton was also elected Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of New York in 1806. He served as Grand Master from 1806 to 1819 and was followed as Grand Master by none other than Daniel Tompkins in 1820. Tompkins only served one year as Grand Master. It seems that the rivalry and then strong dislike between Tompkins and Clinton had existed for a number of years, but it flared up in earnest in 1812, right before De La Mata's arrival, when Clinton ran for the office of United States President against incumbent President James Madison. Clinton lost in a narrow race, and many consider the reason for his loss as Daniel Tompkins throwing his public support behind Madison shortly before the election. So, upon arrival of Cerno in New York in 1806, and De La Mata's arrival in 1813, Tompkins was governor of the state of New York and Clinton was mayor of New York City. Clinton was also Grand Master of the Grand Lodge in New York. Cerno could well have pulled into a situation because of what seemed to be a desire to one-up the other. It may have been felt that Cerno could be of some help, but we don't know exactly what was said or exactly what happened. The reason or reasons why De La Mata traveled to New York are equally elusive. Because of De La Mata's actions and the reactions of Mitchell and Delco, I tend to believe that De La Mata was not sent to New York with clear directions other than maybe Report what you find. Maybe there was some talk about something going on in New York, and De La Mata was sent to check it out. I do not believe that De La Mata was instructed to create a Supreme Council by the Charleston Council. Again, like Cerno, it's very possible that De La Mata traveled to New York for reasons other than Freemasonry. But once there, he made discoveries that he felt required his actions. He acted on what he believed was his authority and responsibility as a Sovereign Grand Inspector General. De La Mata somehow learned of Cerno and visited him at his jewelry shop. They discussed the new 33-degree system. Cerno apparently informed De La Mata about his creation, and De La Mata asked to see his 33rd-degree patent. Cerno apparently did not have one, and that sealed his fate with De La Mata. I don't know why it was such an open and shut case with De La Mata. He knew that this was a brand new system. 
Maybe one or both of them had attitudes that rubbed the other badly. Maybe things were said or done that were not recorded. All is clear is that De La Mata outright rejected Cerno's legitimacy. But Cerno was not all that De La Mata discovered. De La Mata learned of a division in New York Masonry and of a grand consistory of the 32nd degree that was not under either Charleston or Cerno. Charleston apparently knew nothing about this body. It would seem to be a pretty major surprise, and that is the body upon which I would like to focus for a minute. On February 21st, 1802, John Mitchell appointed Alexander de Grasse to the 33rd degree and as Grand Commander of the Supreme Council of the West Indies. One of the 33rds created in this 1802 the Supreme Council by de Grasse was a Mason by the name of Antoine Bedeau. Bedeau was a legitimate, regular 33rd belonging to a Supreme Council, tracing itself back to the Charleston Council. Bedeau traveled from the West Indies with the apparent goal of going to France. He made a stop in New Orleans and then went on to New York, where on August 6th, 1806, he created a grand consistory of the 32nd degree. He then traveled to France, leaving the new consistory to fend for itself. Why did he do that? Bedeau creating this body and then just taking off may seem odd today, but it was exactly what de Grasse had done with the 1802 Council in the West Indies, and he did the same thing with the 1804 Council in Jamaica. It was also common practice with older rites. Bodies would be created by someone with necessary rank, and then they would move on to create bodies elsewhere. This was also exactly what De La Mata did in 1813. It happened more often than we may realize. But the point is that this was a grand consistory of the 32nd degree that could trace itself directly back to the Charleston Supreme Council. Well, that's a good thing, right? Well, maybe not. It all depends on who you ask. Northern Jurisdiction Grand Commander J.J.J. J. J. Gorgas is quoted as saying of the creation of this Grand Consistory. This act of Bedeau's was completely irregular, unconstitutional. He had no right or power within the United States of America, but was tempted and did succumb at the rate of five times $46 or $230. And then there is added by Harris and Carter from their history. Bedeau's patent authorized him to confer degrees and establish bodies conformable to the Grand Constitutions. He should not have been unaware of the legal prohibitions the Grand Constitutions contain and the impropriety of ignoring the existence in the United States of the Supreme Council from which his own had derived. These are two very interesting statements, and we need to look at them with a curious eye. But first, Let's look again at De La Mata. I truly wish that I could have been a fly buzzing around Emmanuel De La Mata when he arrived in New York. He found the area composed of some powerful Masons who were divided into two rival groups. And surprise, surprise, both of these groups had bodies of the new 33 degree system of which they were members. How did that happen? Think about this situation from how De La Mata may have viewed it. He walked into an area and not only found the Masons divided and hostile towards each other, but that each group had a body of the new 33 degree system that Charleston knew nothing about. Each side pointed to the other side as saying that they were the irregular ones. Who, if anyone, was right? Once again, we don't have any records to explain why Badeau created his grand consistory. If he was only a con artist seeking money, then you would think that he would have created more of them. He created no such bodies on his stay in New Orleans. It's not impossible, and just as likely as anything else, that he, like Cerno and De La Mata, walked into the middle of a Masonic dispute that existed in the area. Maybe when he arrived, he just happened to meet the members of one of the groups, the group that included Daniel Tompkins. Maybe they asked him for help. When they learned of who he was and this new system in masonry, they might have felt that this would give him an edge over the other group. They might well have asked him to create the bodies. 
We don't know. He did end up helping one of the sides over the other, and he did create a grand consistory. Bideau left a register in New Orleans, listing established fees for the various degrees. As was normal practice, he charged fees for the degrees. The fees that were charged in themselves mean nothing in the way of the charges thrown against him by Gorgas. Bideau did exactly the same thing that Albert Mackey did when he established a consistory of the 32nd degree in New Orleans in 1852. Fees were charged, and those fees went to the one who did the initiations. The fees helped pay for the travel and living expenses. The idea that the one giving the initiation would do so free of charge and then would also foot the bill for travel and living expenses is nonsense. This was standard practice. But what is also interesting is that he created a grand consistory and not a Supreme Council. Why didn't he? We have no records to show why he didn't take the next step. It would seem that Cerno faced the same situations and took similar actions that Bedeau did only with the other group. The only differences were that Cerno clearly did not know the new system, and while Bedeau stopped with a grand consistory, Cerno created what he viewed to be, or knew of, a Supreme Council. The problem, of course, was that Cerno made quite a few organizational mistakes. Cerno also may have felt that his side was clearly the correct side, as he had none other than the Grand Master supporting him and serving as his Lieutenant Grand Commander. A problem for Cerno was his unfamiliarity with the new system. Giving him the benefit of the doubt, like was done with others, Cerno may just wanted to have been of some help. An example of how Cerno did not know the rules was the fact that he felt that he could create anything at all in the New York area. That area was already occupied. And I don't mean by the Charleston Supreme Council, I mean by Bedeau's Grand Consistory. And I say that regardless of what Gorgas or other Scottish Rite historians have written. Antoine Bedeau was a sovereign Grand Inspector General of the new 33-degree system. Yes, if the Bedeau Grand Consistory did not exist, then it seems that Cyrano may well have had a valid right, also regardless of what has been said, to follow in the same path as John Mitchell to create his bodies in New York. But the Bideau Grand Consistory did exist when Cerno arrived in New York. What made Cerno believe that he could establish anything in the New York area? Well, maybe he didn't know the rules well enough, didn't care about the rules, or he had reason to believe that Bideau did not have the right to establish what he did. I mean, he had the Grand Master on his side, and the Grand Master was no friend of the other side. He may well have told him of their perceived irregularities. Maybe things were not clear cut and Cerno had to make a decision in an unclear situation. Now, Scottish Rite historians have badly viewed both Cerno and Bideau. Giving either one of them the benefit of the doubt does not seem to have been what was desired. But we need to look at a couple of facts. One, the New York Masonic situation was one of being politically and passionately divided. Two, the Grand Master of the Grand Lodge in New York did become Cerno's Lieutenant Grand Commander. It seems that Cerno, as most Masons, would give serious consideration to a sitting Grand Master. I've looked at the Cerno, Bideau, and Charleston situations and actions for many years now. Bideau and Cerno have been vilified by the Scottish Rite historians from the beginning. Cerno, of course, being vilified every time his name is mentioned. But when all the accusations and published accounts are examined, I find confusion, bad or self-serving logic, and excuses on all sides. I find that no one was completely right or wrong. Errors were made by everyone. And everyone wanted you to look at what the other guy did, but not at anything that they did. Bideau involved himself in a local Masonic squabble. He took sides. He created bodies that, in an area that the rules said was unoccupied. He charged a fee for the degrees. The idea that because of that, he was a petty con artist trying to make money off his rank in the Scottish Rite 
is very unfair and wholly unsupported. That was a standard practice of that time, before that time, and after that time, and we know it. So why did De La Mata, of equal rank of Bordeaux, feel the need to heal what Bordeaux had done, and then turn around and create a supreme council out of his grand consistory? There is nothing that I have seen that shows that Bordeaux acted outside of his authority. According to the grand constitutions, that area was considered unoccupied. It was as if a separate nation, regardless of what has been claimed by selective readings of it. But playing armchair quarterback, yes, Bedeau may have saved himself a lot of bad press by saying, geez, I'm so sorry that this situation exists in your area. I wish you all the very best luck, but I have to leave. And then he should have gone on to France. It was the same with Cerno. But the difference in his case was that the Grand Master became involved in what Cerno was doing. We don't know exactly what happened, but the Grand Master did become his Lieutenant Grand Commander. I'd say that the Grand Master liked and approved of what Cerno was doing. But again, playing armchair quarterback, Cerno might have said about the same thing that Bideau should have said. He should have told the Grand Master that he did not know what was going on in the area and that he did not fully know or understand this new system. All he could do was wish all the parties well. But we have to understand that Sir No does not seem to have been just passing through the area like Bedeau. He did open up a jewelry shop and remained in the area for some years. If you are brand new to an area and pulled into a situation of which the Grand Master might be seeking your aid, you may well have taken the same path as Cerno. We just don't know the details. Should he have done it? Well, he was a Deputy Inspector General. Regardless of what he should have done or might have done, he did create those bodies. And he has paid a high price ever since. And what of De La Mata? I've seen nothing that he was under specific orders from Charleston to act in a certain manner, depending on what he found. In fact, from what I've read, it seems that Charleston knew nothing or very little about the situation in New York. It seems that De La Mata walked into a wholly unexpected situation. And it was not as if De La Mata could pick up a telephone and call the members of the Charleston Council. Yes, again, playing armchair quarterback, it may have gone better if De La Mata had just sat back and waited for instructions from Charleston. But he didn't. He also made a decision. He felt that Cerno was irregular. He felt that problems existed with the Bedeau Grand Consistory, so he healed it. He then advanced the Bedeau Grand Consistory to a Supreme Council by what he saw as his right as a Sovereign Grand Inspector General in what he viewed as an unoccupied area. It became the Northern Masonic jurisdiction. He made decisions and acted on them. And then he received letters from the Charleston Council. On August 5th, 1813, Emmanuel de la Mata created the Northern Supreme Council with Daniel D. Tompkins as Sovereign Grand Commander. On August 23rd, 1813, letters were written to de la Mata by both John Mitchell and Frederick Delco. The letters must have given de la Mata some concern. Mitchell told him that no one except maybe de Grasse and Delahogue ever had the 33rd degree. I have no idea how that was understood by De La Mata, but I imagine it caused a bit of confusion with them. Then Delco told him that the Grand Constitutions provided for only one Supreme Council of the United States, and that the Charleston Council was it. That was clearly not what Bedeau, Cerno, De La Mata, Drummond, Baynard, and quite a number of others believed. It was also not what was written in the copy of the Grand Constitutions in Delco's own hand, but it was what Delco wrote to De La Mata. I do not accept that the Grand Constitutions of 1786 were legitimate, but I found no evidence that the original Charleston Supreme Council was created for any ill purpose. I believe that its creation was an effort to help. I believe that a very workable and meaningful system was created along with a story born out of insecurity and doubt that the new system would be accepted without such a story. 
I've seen nothing that has given me reason to believe that the Charleston Supreme Council was created only to be a benefit to its creators. In hindsight, I believe that they should have been open about how the new system was created, and they should not have so quickly and harshly reacted to Cerno. At the very least, it was very poor tactics. I mean, think about it. By the time that De La Mata arrived in New York, both the Cerno and Bideau bodies had existed enough years to have established themselves. On one side, you had the governor of New York, and on the other side, the mayor of New York City, who also happened to be the Grand Master. They didn't like each other. They were skilled and powerful rivals. These were not at all stupid men who were unable to get things done. They were seasoned leaders inside and outside of Freemasonry. They were also not at all afraid of battle. But then De La Mata gets in the middle of them and says, okay, I'll make you guys over here legitimate, but you other guys are done. You're simply irregular. Really? Forget about Cerno. Forget about everything that you have been taught about this situation. Stop for a minute and try to put yourself back to that time and look at it through their eyes with those players. De La Mata is not only telling the sitting Grand Master that he's irregular, but he is telling that to the guy who just months before came within inches of being elected President of the United States. And then, after saying that to that guy, De La Mata creates exactly the same thing as Cerno created. I can't see how in any way that De La Mata thought that this was a good move. And all because De La Mata didn't believe that Cerno was a 33rd? Not quite 30 years after the creation of the Charleston Council, and just over 15 years from this event with Cerno, Moses Holbrook was the Grand Commander of the Southern Jurisdiction, the Charleston Supreme Council. Holbrook didn't know how John Mitchell received the 33rd degree, and he questioned Frederick Delco about it. Delco said that he didn't recollect. Maybe Mitchell signed some obligation for it from some Prussian. Really? How in the world could the Charleston Council at that time not possess and well know the proof of how Mitchell received the 33rd degree? How could that not be front and center in the archives of the Charleston Council? Cerno and Cerno Masons were attacked in every possible way because they could not provide documentation as to how Cerno received the 33rd degree. Now we see that the Charleston Council itself and its leaders, at the very time that they were so harshly attacking Cerno, didn't even know how their grand commander received his 33rd degree. It's astonishing. It's very disturbing. I see no reasonable debate on this issue. The members of the Charleston Council had to have known that they were living in a class house. I believe De La Mata, Mitchell, and Delco should have stopped dead in their tracks once learning the situation in New York and who they were dealing with. Mitchell and Delco should have gotten themselves up to New York as quick as they could. De La Mata should have gone to his hotel room and stayed there until Mitchell and Delco arrived. Mitchell and Delco should have sat down with all interested parties and said, okay, let's talk. I don't care who created what or who had what authority. They had a great opportunity and they were also facing a very serious situation. They should have put all this, you can't exist unless I say it's okay, nonsense aside. Regularity is subjective. They should have stayed locked in that room until they could have found a way to all work together for the unified benefit of this new enlightened system. But they didn't. They went on the attack. Powerful New York Masons, who had abundant ego and skill at battle, were attacked. And they fought back, 
hard. Freemasonry throughout the United States had no idea in the world what was going on, but they paid the price. It was foolish, unnecessary, and against everything that the Scottish Rite teaches, and everyone was to blame. It's been more than 200 years since the creation of the Charleston Council. The creators of the Scottish Rite, as well as all parties involved, were human, and humans sometimes make mistakes in judgment. I believe it's time to be a bit more lenient in our judgments. Did Cerno make mistakes? You bet. Did Charleston make mistakes? You bet. But it's time to let this all go. We don't know the why of Cerno's actions. We do know that many good Masons supported and followed his type of Masonry. A good number of Grand Lodges embraced the so-called Cerno Masonry. Others denounce it to this day and probably don't remember why. But we can find many contributions to the Scottish Rite by Cerno Masons. When we look back to the early Charleston Supreme Council and the years right before its creation, we see a great mess in the old 25 degree system. No matter what mistakes the Charleston Council made or how they acted, they did give us something extraordinarily worthy. We have to stop fighting a 200 year old, unnecessary and self-damaging war. We are in a new day and a new age. Things are changing around us at near breakneck speed. The young members of the Scottish Rite want its teachings and its philosophy of honor, integrity, and ethics. They want their lodges and bodies to be more than a reading of the minutes and a hot meal. They don't give a blue flip about some 200-year-old pointless argument about who was right and who was wrong. We have to move on. We need to close that chapter completely. We must do the work that needs to be done. Our craft lodges and other bodies need help. If Freemasonry wants to survive, it must change with the world. But I don't mean turning into something that we have never professed. I mean making sure that we are what we have always professed. We must realize that the Scottish Rite has a cloudy history. We must realize that so much of our history is opinion rather than provable fact. We must stop insisting that our members believe anything at all in order to keep our guys in a positive light. It's okay to mess up. We are all human, but we must not have one standard of judgment for us and another for them. That's not what we teach. We need more real brotherhood. That's my two cents. Thank you for watching. If you like the videos, please hit the like button and subscribe to us. See you next time.